truly he's taken us into a season, an appointed season of blessings. And that's what I want to settle in our spirits on today. We thank God for our pastor. Why don't we give our pastor a hand, honor the Lord for him, and just how God is using him in a time like this. I got really excited about the shut-in uh, because I know usually when you sacrifice for the Lord like that, God always has a great blessing for you. And so as I prepared for that, the Lord just began to minister to me about some things. And it was interesting on uh, Friday night on the way here, as Pastor and I were driving, I began to do that mental check, and I was like, oh, I said, I forgot my iPad at home, and I knew we were going to be going into studies. And uh, so when I got to the church, I pulled out my old Bible, which is my study Bible, which was good, and I believe that it was something that was the, appointed by God, because as I began to flip through the Bible, as our Pastor was doing the two-hour teaching, I stumbled across something that I've kept in my Bible since 2003. And it says, this is truly a blessing from God. And I had miracle, exclamation, exclamation. This was November 18, uh, 2003. And I pulled it out, and I was looking, and it was a check that I copied that someone had placed in my hands for $1,000. Um, and then the same week that the Lord blessed me with a person just put $1,000 in my hand, a check, then I got a, um, cash for $20, and I made a copy of that as well, and then someone else put another check in my hand for $15. And when I pulled this out, I said, wow, and I saw a miracle, and I said, Lord, this is a reminder that what you've done before, that you can do it again. Amen. How many of you all know that sometimes... Things that you see are just seed. It's just a seed, amen, for what God has. So I want to encourage you, amen, to reach beyond your breaking point and trust God. As our pastor gives us inst instructions, follow those instructions. They're instructions for life. And then um, sometimes God requires that we embrace change. So don't be hesitant to change. Change is good. I believe that sometimes God allows change to bring us into the position that he wants for us. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you now, Lord, to send your spirit to touch the hearts of your people. Anoint Dr. Grace and myself to preach that and to teach that which will be edifying to your people. Let them be blessed, Lord. And we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. Amen. So we're doing something a little different today. Uh, usually I stand up and hoop and holler and y'all look at me and I be killing myself. So I'm sitting down like y'all sitting down today. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a teaching session for the next three weeks and I promise you what you're about to hear many of you have never heard before when it comes to relationships. As a matter of fact, on our presentation, we call it Victorious Relationships. Uh, uh, no more drama, the spirit of relationships. We're doing a three-part series called The Body, the Soul, and the Spirit of Relationships. Uh, this is actually a course that we teach. We've been all over the country and all over the world uh, uh, teaching this. We've been to St. Louis, we've been to Michigan, we was in Tampa, we've been in uh, uh, Maryland, um, in various places, uh, sometimes teaching the small classes of 10 or 15, sometimes to hundreds and thousands when we were at the National uh, 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 Convention of the Church of God in Christ. We thank God for each and every one of you. Victorious relationships, lifestyles. I always show uh, this picture, this image, at every presentation all over this country. The reason why I show that is I spent a lot of money for them TFIS and I got to show them off. <laughs> Y'all don't like me. Uh, I, I, I show that actually because when I first got married, I was happy, but I didn't show my teeth. But now I got some dental implants and some braces and some whitener. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, 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 I show that because I want people to know um, that I'm still happy. 
that after 25 years of marriage, that was our 25th wedding uh, 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 renewal service, I'm still happy. But unfortunately, a lot of people aren't. Out of the tens of thousands of people that got married that same year with Dr. Grace and I, half of them are not even together. The ones that are together, they're not happy. They're not smiling like that. And so I, I want to talk to you about that uh, today. And I, I think it's going to be a blessing to you. And we, we first started out talking about godly relationships. Godly relationships. Dr. Grace? As human beings, we are sociable creatures designed for relationships. We were hardwired by God. When he created us, he designed us to be in relationship with each other. In Genesis chapter 1 and 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So our survival actually requires physical, emotional, and spiritual support from each other. And, and, and when we say that, here is the challenge or the problem. We fail at it miserably. So we were created to be social creatures, but we fail at it miserably. You're not a loner. I know sometimes you get mad and say, I'm going home, taking my ball, and I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to deal with none of these folks. I'm quitting the church, I'm quitting the job, I'm quitting the marriage. But you know what? You weren't created for that. You were created to be in relationship. And yet we fail horribly. When, when, when I look at this uh, uh, presentation here, it says we have a divorce rate of over 50%. We have dysfunctional and estranged families. We don't get along with our coworkers. We are challenged with relationships we have with our brothers and sisters, even in the church. Uh, 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 something uh, that I, uh, I, I shared the uh, other day uh, that I learned and then I shared it with a group. And that was, I, I was in this session with executive, corporate executives and everybody at this table are bank presidents and company owners. And uh, we had a presentation that talked about why people leave companies. And the guy said, people don't leave companies. They leave supervisors. I want that to marinate for a minute. They don't leave IBM and Nortel. They leave the jokers that they got to work with. Or y'all ain't working with me. We were supposed to work together, but we do a horrible job at it. We get upset with each other. We, we get so upset because these forces that we're going to get into cause what we call drama. Drama. Let, 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 let's kind of go into this today. Uh, Dr. Grace? Some relationships su succeed while others fail. Why is that? Is it luck? Is it chance? Fortune? Is it being in the right place at the right time? And the answer resoundingly is no. It's a lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4 and 6 states it clearly for us. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. And, and, and when we look at this, I need everybody to remember this number here. Everybody say 1585. Say it again, 1585. We call this the 1585 rule. And I'm going to demonstrate this. 15% of what we have spent all of our time and energy on uh, attributes to our success. The other 85% that we don't get um, is a majority of the success. Let me say that again. The 1585 rule. About 15% of one of, of your success comes from your technical knowledge. Where are my college students at? Raise your hand. Put those hands down. 
I went to college. I got a degree in computer science, electrical engineering. I was a little bit smart. I got a, a, a US government patent uh, with the government for a computer program that I wrote to this day. And so I knew my stuff. I went to the job, but here's the problem. The people on the job didn't like me. None of them was my color. Y'all going to get it in a minute. They thought I was arrogant. They thought I was aggressive. I was just being assertive. But I had spent all of this time learning how to do computers and electrical engineering. I got some money here. It's a why. It it's a whole bunch of ones. You know, folks, I can think of money, put a hundred dollar bill in number ones. But actually, it's a hundred ones. It's a hundred ones. Now, I want to show you a representation of what this means. Fifteen percent. So, fifteen of these represent what those college students are doing right now. They're gaining knowledge, technical experience on their careers and what they want to do in life, which is what I did. Technical knowledge. Anybody, uh, uh, but there's a saying that says, you are hired for your skills, but fired for your behavior. When you get let go, you still got the same resume you had when you got started. So why did they let you go? You didn't get dumb. They let you go because of your behavior. So here's the 15%. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. This is what Will did. I went to high school. High school costs about $2,400 to $5,000 a year. I know because we have been a high school uh, uh, after school program. I went to college. I know how much that cost that I got a daughter in college. <laughs> Praise Jesus. About $20,000 a year. All of that that we spent all that money on attributes to 15% of your success in life. The other 85% of you being successful, the other 85% will come from your ability to get along with people. And guess how much you have put into learning how to do that? Nothing. You just threw it all away. Now, let me, let me be real clear about that 85%. A young lady came to me and she was very frustrated and aggravated. She said, Pastor, I was the most educated, 15%. The most experienced, 15%. The most knowledgeable, 15%. But they didn't give me the promotion. They gave it to somebody else. I said, no, they didn't. Tell me that again. I was the most educated, most experienced, most knowledgeable. I had my MBA, but they gave the promotion to somebody else. I said, that it can't be true. Tell me that again. I don't believe it. I didn't hear that. I was the most experienced the most knowledge. I had my MBA, and they didn't give me the promotion. They gave it to somebody else. I made them say it five times. And then I said, well, who did they give it to? She said, they gave it to somebody that they liked. So I said, with all your education, your degrees, and your experience, why didn't they like you? Why didn't you figure out, well, Pastor, they're haters. Okay, I ain't got nothing to do with that. They're racist. I don't care. Why didn't they like you? And the reason why they didn't is because you didn't invest in that 85%. Because that's not mystical, that's not magic, that's knowledge. You can learn how to get along with anybody. You can learn how to get along with haters. You can learn how to get along with introverts and extroverts. It's just knowledge. And my people fail and are destroyed for a, I can't hear you, lack of knowledge. The reason why you can't get along, college students, with them roommates. Y'all ain't working with me. Them sorrows, brothers. Reason why y'all falling out, husbands and wives, because you don't have knowledge of the person that you're in relationship with. Amen. Can we move forward? Are y'all ready to learn something today? So there are three things that we want to share today. They are the body, soul, 
and spirit of relationships. We're going to talk about one of them. Now, the one we're going to talk about is the first one that Dr. Grace and I wrote about. We wrote this eight years ago. The first book was called No More Drama Relationships. It deals with the fact that everybody hear me. You are made up of body, soul, and spirit. Do you get that? You are a physical body, you have an emotional soul, and you have a spirit. It's called the human spirit. You are body, soul, and spirit. That makes you up. When you enter into a relationship, the relationship takes on a body, a soul, and a spirit. Your relationship. Every relationship. And so, the first book we wrote dealt with the spirit. It's called No More Drama Relationship. The second book we wrote was called The Relationship Battle Plan. That dealt with the physical body. You got to have a plan. You are under attack. He that fails to plan, plan to fail. And the third book we wrote was called Soulmates, Soul Ties, and Soul Survivors. That book right there dealt with the emotions, the soul, the condition that we find ourselves in as we're dealing with relationships. So let's move forward, Dr. Grace. So the impact of drama. It's human nature to take things personal. We always take things personal. The book, No More Drama, offers tools, strategies, and principles for us to live by. Everyone at some level deals with drama, whether it's marital discord um, leading to separation or divorce, or dealing with workplace drama that leads to people quitting or being fired, family drama that leads to estrangement, or church drama that leads to division and rebellion. Drama impacts every area of our life, and it prevents us from achieving the purpose for our existence. It prevents us from being um, destroyed, and it destroys our relationships that were designed to bring about God's purpose in our lives. How many of y'all have dealt with some drama in the last week? How many of y'all have dealt with some drama this year? Okay, now if your hand ain't raised, you the drama. You causing everybody else drama. Y'all ain't working with a brother in here today. You just sitting there like, I ain't had no drama. Cause you the drama. <laughs> Somebody say amen. 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 Don't be pointing at him. I see him. <laughs> drama comes in four stages. There are four levels of drama. Um, Read that for us, Dr. Grace, Ephesians 6 and 10. That's our lesson text. Ephesians 6, 6 and 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so these four levels of drama come in what we call, what this scripture identifies as principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me break these four down for you real quickly. The first one is called uh, principalities. Everybody say principalities. Principalities are what is known as territorial drama. These are demonic forces that have oversight over territories. Uh, 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 they correspond to the rank of generals in Satan's satanic army. They create what I call territorial drama. This is what happens when you are new to an environment and people are very territorial. You start a job, and somebody feels like you're there to take over their job. You come to church, and, 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 and we have people in, in ministry, in ministry, fighting over position. Ain't now one, now, now one of y'all getting paid. <laughs> but we fight. Territorialism. These are what principalities it come from the word principle. A principle is over an area. So these are territorial spirits. Then? And powers. These are various levels of foot soldiers. They would be considered the privates of the demonic world that attack at, at the individual or personal level and produce what is called personal drama. This is a drama of personal attacks and destruction, victimization of people by using their personal failures and weaknesses as Satan's influences. 
Then there is what is called rulers of the darkness of this world. Rulers of the darkness of this world are the satanic forces uh, that, take, that have charge over Satan's worldly businesses. With rulers of the darkness of this world are uh, called uh, uh, temptation. Temptations are all in this world. The Bible says all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The pride of life. The pride of life. And so these forces uh, uh, tempt us and get us off task or off path towards what God has planned, the purpose and the destiny that he's given us. And so what happens many times is we could be doing good and we get tempted. That's why Jesus said, pray every day. Lead us not into temptations because we get tempted uh, uh, from these forces all the time. And then finally, spiritual wickedness in high places. And these are the demonic forces that have charge over religion and operate in the church. They produce what is called church or spiritual drama. This is a drama that stems from the church hurt from lay members and spiritual abuse by church leaders. All right, now, the, here's the way drama works. I want everybody to hear me on this. Drama always starts out very small. It's like a little fox. It's like when me and my wife got married, the first fight we had was kind of cute. We had to have the makeup. Y'all ain't working with me. Had a little makeup. It gets kind of cute. And let me tell you about how drama works. Jesus ran into a man in the garden, and it's in our, in our notes, and he said, he ran into a man, and he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. I looked up the Legion, and the number was 6,826. This man had 6,826 unclean spirits possessing, oppressing, pressuring him, causing anxiety, causing crazy. He was cutting himself. He was losing his mind because of all these demons. And I thought, I said to myself, Lord, how did he get to that point? How did he get to that point? Well, the Bible tells us, Jesus said it. He started with just one. The Bible says when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. Uh, 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 come up here, Brother George. Come up here. So me and my wife, we're doing good. We just got married. We're excited. We're happy. And here comes a, 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 a force. Come on up and stand right here. And, and what this force does is it creates a little tension. A little tension. And we have a little tiff. But we good, so we kick the drama out. We have some good makeup. Y'all can fill in the rest of the blanks. And everything looks good. But he's not content. You know what he does? While we thinking anything is good, he's going out finding him seven more boys. He finds seven more. And the Bible says the state of that man is even worse. So it started with just one. But then it became seven. So now the fight ain't all that cute no more. Y'all ain't working with me. It's getting a little pressure and a little anxiety, a little stress. But we start praying and believing God, so we kick them out. Y'all get out of here. We're trying to be married. <laughs> but they are restless too. So y'all go find some more people and bring them up back up here on this stage. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Y'all got to get this. I really need y'all to see what's going on. Everybody say, it started with one. Everybody say, it started with one. I kicked them out. One became, but I kicked them out. But guess what? Each one of them went out and found another seven each. So now seven became 49. Oh, y'all ain't working with me. So now, the first fight we, was cute, and I wanted to drink her bath water. By about now, I'm ready to drown her in it. <laughs> oh, don't y'all play with me. We be calling each other all kind of names. I know y'all say, but y'all some cussing safe folk. <laughs> y'all will cuss each other out, call each other all kind of names. I am preaching. I'm not just talking to married folk. Y'all be cussing folk out on the job. Y'all be... 
You see, it, it, it first was just throwing a little shade, throwing a little shade. But now you slanging Langlo preach right there, Pastor Will. <laughs> and so when Jesus got to this man, because, check this out, 49 went out. They came back with seven each. It got up to 343. 343 went out. They came back, and they brought seven each. It was 2,401. 2,401 get kicked out. They came back, they came back, and before you know it, that man was at legion level. Now, you can't even sleep. You got to keep one eye open because you don't know what she's doing. You want to test the food, make sure it's okay. I'm preaching. <laughs> You're spying on each other. Oh, I'm preaching right there. Amen. I'm preaching right there. What's she up to? What he up to? Checking each other's phone. Why you got your phone locked? <laughs> Somebody say, because you know what happened? Jesus came to this man. He said, what is your name? The man said, my name is Peter. And then they said, for we are many. My name is Legion, for we are many. That's what happens with drama. It becomes many. It becomes over exorbitant. And so now we can't stand each other on the campus. We can't stand each other in the home. We can't stand each other the job. Let me tell you how bad it is. A person on their job will have a person attack them and cause them to lose their job. You don't even know me. And you are attacking the way I take care of my babies. You're attacking the way I take care of my spouse. Y'all ain't working with me. So you got a legion, and now I got legion in me. I'm going home getting my gun. I'm coming up here and shooting up everybody. Did y'all get that? Did y'all see that? Give them a great big hand. No, don't give legion a hand. That's the devil. I'll get, get on out of here. Get out of here. Messing my life up. So, now, what this represents and what I want everybody to get, and we're not going to take very much more time, but I want y'all to get this analogy here. What this represents is four different types of spirits. We're going to talk about one today. Everybody say powers. Powers. Say it again, powers. powers. First lady. We have the power to choose. The good news here is that the so, uh, this is a solution to drama. Mark 5 and 15, it says, and, and they came to Jesus and see him that he was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now, I need y'all to understand, over and over, these forces kept coming back and getting worse and worse and worse. But when Jesus showed up, what separated, what changed was this time when the forces, when the drama got kicked out, Instead of that man being clean and empty, and that's what the Bible meant, because when you're empty, the forces have something to come back to. Jesus filled him with the Spirit. Y'all ain't working with me. He filled him with the Spirit. And so here's what I need every saint to understand. Before you were saved, you had no way to deal with this stuff. It would come and go. You'll be good one day. You want to kill somebody the next. You had no way of dealing with that. But once you accepted Christ, you got the Holy Ghost. Now you have the power to tell those demons no. To tell powers no. You have the power now to choose. Before you did, as Christians, we now have the power to choose. So we can choose, First Lady. We can choose to be better, not bitter. We can choose to turn to each other and not turn on each other. And we can choose to be powerful and not powerless. Before, when these forces attacked us, they made us bitter. Anybody have experienced bitterness? When somebody do something to you, it, it really does something in you. Hallelujah. Anybody ever turned on somebody that you used to like? Or somebody turned on you that was your friend? Those are powers. Anybody ever felt like you were just powerless? These are what powers do to us. But when you get the Holy Spirit, you instead of becoming bitter, you become better. Now when me and First Lady have our disagreements, we learn from them and we go stronger. Oh, we still fight. Y'all ain't working with me. Now instead of turning on each other, we turn to prayer. And we turn 
uh, uh, to God. Instead of being powerless, we realize that we now have power. So let me give you these last two points, and we're going to be through. I want you to say this with me. Say this loud. Say, I will, I will. no longer no be a victim of their failures. Let me explain that, Dr. Grace. A victim is someone who is subjected to oppression, to hardship, to mistreatment. They don't do it for me. And this causes frustration. Disillusionment. See, here's what happens. When you enter into a relationship, there was a reason why you entered into that relationship. I don't care what relationship it is. It is so that you could be benefited from that person. When I entered into my wife's relationship, her life was supposed to get better because I was in it. Are y'all with me? When she entered into my life, my life was supposed to get better because she was now in it. Why? Because when we come together in relationships, we were created to meet needs. There's a book called His Needs, Her Needs. And so I have needs. Y'all ain't working with a brother. My wife came to fulfill my needs. She has needs. I came to fulfill her needs. But what do you do when the person isn't fulfilling those needs? Oh, y'all ain't working with me. Some of these needs, First Lady? Some needs are innate. Some needs are inherited. Some needs are nurtured or formed. Uh, Psalm 51 and 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So they are physical. Our needs are psychological. Our needs are spiritual. But when unmet, it causes drama. Right there. You came into my life to meet a need, but now you're failing to meet it and it's causing me drama. Any mothers in here, raise your hand. Got quite a few. All right. Why does your baby cry? Because the baby has needs. So as mothers, what do we do? The baby cry, we see if the baby's wet. If the baby's wet, we change the baby, the baby stop crying. If the baby's still crying, we see if the baby's hungry. We feed the baby. The baby stopped crying. But if the baby is still crying, we say, well, maybe the baby wants to be held. So we held and shake the baby. And, and oh, you know, hopefully you ain't shaking the baby. That's what some of you <laughs> We rock the baby. That's the right words. See, I'm not a mother. But what happens, mothers, when the baby keeps crying? See, here's the problem. The baby can't adequately communicate that there's still another need that's being unmet. So the baby is crying. And the baby is crying. And so if the baby cry long enough, mothers, and we still dealing with our issues, ain't get no sleep, no rest, hormones, rage, and all that kind of stuff. So guess what we start doing? Oh, y'all ain't working with me. So we start crying at the baby. The baby like, ah, the baby, ah, 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 ah. I need you to stop crying. I need you to stop crying. Okay, y'all ain't working with me. Oh, I just said something. You know what I just said? I call this the crybaby syndrome because that's what we're doing with each other. When you're arguing and fighting and going back and forth, you know what you're doing? The reason why the person is crying is because there's a me that is not being met. But you don't know how to meet that need so now you're crying back at them. I need y'all to get this. Because this happens all the time. We fail to meet each other's needs. Because I'm, 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 let me be real clear. I only cry when I have a need. If I'm satisfied, I ain't crying. So why are we arguing and fighting all the time? There's a need that's not being met. Okay, now some of y'all say, Pastor, they know better. They know, they know, they know. No, they don't. It's not that they won't meet your needs. They can't. Nobody intentionally wants a crying baby. Nobody intentionally wants an argument or fight with a roommate or a husband or a wife or a co-worker. So, what's the problem? We don't know how to meet what they need. And they are failing to meet our needs. First lady. When people don't meet our needs, it's not our fault. 
It's their failure. Say that one, one more time first. I need everybody to get this. When people don't meet our needs, it's not our fault. It's their failure. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Come on, y'all work with me. Say, neighbor. neighbor. Stop being a victim of somebody else's failure. If a person is not meeting your needs, it's not your fault. It's their failure. They were put into your life to meet a specific need, and now they're not doing it. And the reason why they're not doing it is because they can't do it right now. Now, maybe you can say, Pastor, they know better. They know how to do it. I didn't say they didn't know how. I said they can't. Maybe they can't because they're upset. Don't touch me. Maybe they can't because they got an attitude. Maybe they can't because they had a bad day at home and they're bringing it to the job. Or they had a bad day at the job and they're bringing it to the home. But all we know is, right now, you can't meet my needs. First lady, read that passage in Genesis. Genesis, Genesis chapter 4 and, 4 and 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Why did God ask that question? God did not ask Cain, was he his brother's keeper? You know why? Because Cain wasn't his brother's keeper. You know who was Abel's keeper? God was. And God was the one who avenged Abel. Let me be real clear, and I need everybody to hear me on this. Although we are put into people's lives and people are put into our lives to meet our needs, they cannot supply our needs always. And they cannot supply our needs all the time. Some of us marry people to make us happy. Oh, y'all ain't working with me. We develop friendships that would have our backs. And you know what? Sometimes they do. Sometimes we, make, we do make each other happy. But you know what? Sometimes we don't. You know why? Because there's this thing called seasons. And so sometimes your relationships are at a high and you're feeling really good, and sometimes they're not. Why? Because we cannot supply all your needs. There's only one person that can supply all your needs, and his name is Jesus. That's why Paul said, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. So here's the deal. Here's what I need everybody to get. Before you get strung out and allow yourself to be a victim of a person who's not meeting your needs, it is imperative that you understand the person who's designed to supply all your needs is Jesus. And if you don't get that, you will always be frustrated. You will always be bitter. You will always be angry. Because before anybody can set up to meet your needs, you must already have them met through Jesus. Amen. You must already, oh, y'all ain't working with me. You should not be trying to find somebody that's going to make you happy. You should already have joy through your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because if a person comes into your life and they make you happy, but then they turn on you and leave you, you will be okay because you already had joy before they showed up. Everybody must understand that this thing is spiritual. And you must realize that a spiritual God was designed to supply your needs before anybody else ever showed up in your life. And when those forces attack the people who are in your life, you must know that you are already supplied if they flip the script, if they turn because people always shift, people always change, people always go crazy. You can't control people, but God... God said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. I am the God that will supply all your needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm preaching by myself. And I shall not want. Therefore, I am no longer a victim to the whims of people. Yes, I need people. But when people go off, I'm still good because I've got my God. When people lose their mind, I'm still good. So yes, I want somebody that loves me. But when you flip and start hating me, I'm still good because God I was loving me before you showed up. God said, I love you with a love that conquers a multitude of evil. I was loving you when nobody else loved you. When, when, when you make me depressed and angry, I can still get back up. When, when, when I become impatient because of what you're doing. I got long suffering because I got the grace and the power and the love of God deep 
on the inside of me. So when you get your act together, I'll be right here. But I'm going to be content. And when you come back, I'll welcome you back. Because you didn't make me better. I got better. You didn't, oh, y'all, I'm, I'm preaching by myself. You didn't make me lose my mind in sin. Yes, I got angry, but I didn't sin because I had the Holy Ghost that kept me from attacking you back. He kept me. Oh, I'm preaching right there. You're not meeting my needs, but that's okay. They are already supplied. It's kind of like I'm a preach right there. Oh, that's a, it's like this. Before you got married, before you went to a relationship, your daddy had already set aside a little account. Oh, y'all ain't working with a brother right now. That when things got short, and when people weren't doing what they're supposed to do, you can always dip back into that other account. Yeah. It was already supplied for you. Oh, my daughter know about that. I don't hear from her much, but when I hear that phone ring and say, hi, daddy. I know what time it is. <laughs> time for daddy to show up. And you don't know, you got the same kind of daddy. Preach right here. <laughs> you got the same kind of daddy. He hear you when you call. Ask to my husband, God, my wife, God, these co-workers, God, this church. God said, I will supply all your needs. When y'all get that at a spiritual level, then you'll stop being a victim of another person's failure. Amen. Amen. You'll stop being a victim of what they failed to do. I got one last point. I know I'm out of time, but can y'all give me about five more minutes? Can y'all give me about five more minutes to get this? The last point here, first lady, is, uh, uh, go ahead. No longer a, wi a victim of their weakness. Let's say that. Say, I will, I will. no longer, no longer. Be a victim of another person's weakness. A victim is one who's wounded, injured, hurt, or destroyed. They keep doing it to me, and that causes anger and wrath to build up in you. So let me tell you the second level, and we're almost through. Y'all getting anything out of this? Yeah. Let me give you the second level of power. So the first level of powers is... They cause people you're in relationship with to fail you. And that's why you got to make sure you're connected with God to fulfill that need until they get their act together. Are y'all with me? The second level is when a person is weak and they attack you. First thing that bothered me was you weren't doing what you're supposed to do. But now you are taking it out on me and attacking me. That's the second level of personal attacks. And they usually happen because of the first one. So let me get this straight. So check this out. So here's a person who's supposed to meet my needs, but they're not. So when my needs are not met, I get weak. Y'all didn't get that. When my needs are not being met, I get weak. When I am weak, then I become susceptible to the force that then leads me to attack the person that didn't meet my need. I am weak because my needs weren't met and now because of that vulnerability an unclean force can lead me then to attack them. To attack. So I got weak because my wife didn't meet my needs. And now that I'm weak, I'm now susceptible to forces that cause me to attack her. To attack her. And they attack because of personal desires and wants. Some people attack us because there's something in us they want. Let me say that again. They attack you because they see something in you that they want. Some people attack us to prevent us from getting something they want. So now I'm going to attack you because I want it and I got to keep you from getting it. Okay, y'all still ain't working with me today. All right? And some people attack us and don't even know what they want. So now I'm attacking you and I don't even know why. Anybody ever had uh, 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 a hater, somebody going after you and you didn't even know why? Like you ain't even know them. You didn't do nothing to them, but yet they attack you. And you, let me tell you the truth. 
They don't even know why they're attacking you. Oh, y'all ain't going to work with me. The Bible says, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head. Let me explain, and this is very important that everybody get this. The reason why you are attacked nine times out of ten has nothing really to do with you. When you are attacked, it is because that person was vulnerable to a power, an unclean force that led them to attack you. Now, they may use some weak, lame excuse. But here's how you know it's an excuse. Because it ain't like you ain't did that before. So why all of a sudden you're attacking me today? Oh, y'all still ain't working with me. Y'all awfully quiet on the brother this morning. <laughs> so I'm being attacked. And here's the key that you got to get. Let's finish this up first, lady. It's not about you. It's about the God in you. When people attack us, it's not our fault. It is their weakness. So stop being a victim of other people's weakness. John chapter 8 and 44, it says, Ye are of the Father, the devil, and the lust of the Father ye will do. So they simply just can't help it. Because a person is weak and vulnerable, they can be... Now, I'm not saying that they're possessed, but let me tell you something. The devil's certainly pushing them. <laughs> Y'all ain't working with me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. My wife can tell you plenty of times that she ain't did nothing. I just came in the house fussing. I tried over here. I just came in, and she's she looking at me like, what did I do? And you know what? She didn't do anything. At that moment, I was vulnerable to a force that caused me to attack my wife. Maybe I was mad at the people on my job. Maybe I was frustrated because the money didn't come in right. Maybe I was upset with church members. Y'all ain't working with me. Maybe I was bothered by this person who said they was with me and then they walked out on me. But now that person ain't here for me to attack, so I attack the person that's closest to me. Wow. Am I preaching to anybody in here? Yeah. And so because of that, I end up attacking the person that I love because I am weak and vulnerable because I wasn't in a position to be strengthened because my needs weren't met. So now I'm attacking the person that's the closest to me because they're right there. And here's the key that you got to get about attacks. Everybody hear me. We read this at the beginning as I close. We read this at the beginning. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual witness, high places. We wrestle against forces. So anybody in here ever been in this situation where you had two managers, two supervisors, two bosses, two executives who were warring against each other and you were trapped in the middle? Yeah. Anybody ever been in that situation? Okay. They are fighting, but somehow you got in the middle of it. So now, this boss looking at you evil because you with that boss and that one looking at you crazy because you did what that one wanted you to do. And it ain't got nothing to do with you. Well, you know what? We read about that in scripture by a man named Joe. Preach right there, Pastor Will. God and Satan was walking around and, 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 and Satan, God said, what are you doing? He said, I'm walking to and fro. And God said, have you considered my servant Joe? Satan said, God said and said, well, he's just doing that because you are protecting him. And all of a sudden, Job got attacked. And everybody assumed that Job did something wrong. See, sometimes y'all think, oh, preach right there. Because you're under attack, it may be something that you're doing wrong. I'm going to preach right there. Because your money is messed up, it must be something that you're doing wrong. Because your friends are walking out on you, something that you're doing wrong. Because you're under onslaught, something that you're doing wrong. But sometimes it ain't got nothing to do with you. The Bible said to Samuel, he said, they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. In other words, saints of God, because there are unclean forces that are pushing and manipulating people who are close to you and then they attack you. Please understand that has nothing to do with you. They are being influenced by a force whose father is the devil and they are attacking you because your God is God. It ain't got nothing to do with that person or you. But the two forces, preach right there, Pastor Rio, are in internal conflict and they are battling. And here's what they are trying to stop. 
in the early years of our marriage, me and Dr. Grace went through. I know I'm nice and sweet and perfect. Who couldn't possibly get along with me? <laughs> Y'all ain't working with a brother right now. Who couldn't possibly love Will Nichols? <laughs> He's so kind and sweet and humble and submissive. How could First Lady ever get upset with him? And surely I couldn't get upset with her. Oh, she's so graceful. Her name is what in the world? She's the grace of God. My name is Will. I'm the will of God. <laughs> so we got the grace of God and the will of God. How could they possibly have problems? <laughs> well, I do want you to know we did. I had my bags packed. I packed my bags. I took them to the door. They didn't get outside the door. But they were sitting right there at the door. <laughs> and as quiet as it's kept, as nice and as sweet as I am, y'all ain't working with me. As great of a guy and pleasant and sweet as I am, <laughs> Grace has been like, this ain't what I signed up for. I ain't, I ain't want to deal with all of this. This is too much. I can't take this. I can't take him. He's a that. I can't do this. I, okay, y'all ain't working with me. So how did we get past that when others didn't? How did we get through that when others didn't? It is because we first and foremost learn the knowledge of spiritual influence and spiritual forces. And the first thing that we got, to, we realize is that she can't change me and I can't change her. But both of us can war in the spirit. I'm preaching right there. Both of us can war to a point that whatever is influencing my husband to attack me, I got to leave him alone and start dealing with that power. Whatever is causing my wife to be upset with me and don't want me to touch her and don't want this, I got to leave her alone because if I attack her, y'all ain't working with me. Then now I just became susceptible to the force that's pushing me. Get her, get her, get her. And now she's going to say, get him, get him, get him. And, 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 and those forces are trying to do something. And what they're trying to do is spiritual. Everybody say spiritual. Let me be real clear. If the enemy had succeeded... In our first three years in destroying our marriage, guess what? There would be no Pastor Will and Dr. Grace. There would be no victorious praise. There would be no Crystal and Anthony. There would be no sons and daughters. There would be no shed-ins. There would be no prayer. There would be no books. Oh my God. We wouldn't be out now ministering to tens and hundreds and thousands of people telling them that this marriage thing can hurt. And that when they say, none of this would have happened. There would have been no books, no toolkits. We wouldn't be at a national level telling couples how to make their marriage work. Why? Because those unclean forces were not attacking will and grace. They were attacking our destiny. They were attacking our purpose. They were attacking this church that would be birthed. They were attacking the books that would be written. And I don't know what God's plan is for your marriage. Maybe it is to break a generational curse of divorce. I don't know what God's plan is for you on that job. Maybe it is to break a generational curse of poverty. I don't know what God's plan is for you. But maybe it is to show whatever happened to me will not happen to my children. It will not happen to my family. God placed me to be a standard and I will change everything. My family will not go into poverty because I'm going to be rich. <laughs> My children will not be beating on each other when they get married because we didn't beat on each other. They won't be abused because although I was abused, I'm going to show them what a true loving daddy is. I'm going to show them what a true loving mama is. I'm going to not be a victim oh, yes. of their weakness. And so first lady, we close with this and I want everybody to get this and then we're going to pray. We close by what first lady? When uh, we find ourselves in the middle of a battle, just understand that it's not about you, it's about your anointing. 
It's about your purpose, and it's about the plan of God for your life. So stop worrying. Philippians chapter 4 and 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And then Psalms 37 gives us some more ammunition for the enemy. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. I'm going to pray right here, but the last word I want to say with you all is turn it around. Say that with me, turn it around. Turn it around. What the enemy meant for evil, turn it around. What these forces were trying to do, turn it to your faith. The Bible says, as for me, you meant it for evil, Satan. You tried to destroy my home. You tried to destroy my marriage. But I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to turn it around. How am I going to turn it around? Because I realize now that this is spiritual. I need everybody to get this. I need everybody to get it. Everybody stay spiritual. Spiritual. The reason why I'm here is not because grace fixed me. It's not because I trained her. It is because we both went in spiritually yes. and we began to deal with unclean forces. And all of a sudden, the way I used to deal with evil, I don't deal with that no more. Instead of being succumbed to evil, when you attack the person that's attacking you, you just got overcome with evil. Yes. But the Bible says overcome evil with, good. with good. When you get spiritual, that's the only way to do it. Overcome hate with love. Overcome depression with joy. Overcome trouble with peace. The only way to do that is spiritual. When people come to me and they're frustrated and they're aggravated, they say, Pastor, I tried to pray and it didn't work. I tried to fast and it didn't work. Here's the point that they miss. It ain't something that you do today and it gets fixed tomorrow. It's something that you do all the time. And as you go your way, you are healed. Spiritual warfare is a constant thing. Jesus said to pray. I can't hear you. To pray every day. This is something you got to do all the time. It amazes me how we give up on prayer. Because we didn't give it a time limit, a time frame, a date uncertain. And if it don't happen by this time, I'm out. When you don't understand, it takes a consistent, persistent prayer. Yes. We are here today because we first dealt with this thing spiritually. And guess what? 29 years later, guess what we still have to do? We still have to pray. I want everybody to stand. I want everybody to stay. Did y'all get anything today? Yes. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Before I pray, I need everybody to think about the attacks, about the pressure, about the stress, about the things that have been happening to you. And I want you to develop a different strategy today. And that strategy is what I normally do. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to engage in the attacks. I'm not going to engage in the fights. I'm not going to be a victim of their weakness. I'm not going to be a victim uh, 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 of their failures. But instead, I'm going to go spiritual. So I want everybody in here. What did I say? Turn it around? I want you to turn around right now. And when you come back around, I want you to begin to praise God and believe God that we're going to overcome every attack, overcome every enemy. Hallelujah. We are in the middle of turning things around right now. Come on, somebody said, I'm turning it around. 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 Come on, clap those hands. Bless the name of Jesus. Turn that situation around right now. Turn that home around. Turn that family around. Turn that marriage around. Turn that situation around. Lift those hands up real high. Hallelujah.
Now this message and this teaching wasn't designed to make you shout and dance, but it was designed to make you develop a strategy to overcome the spiritual forces that are bringing drama in your life. Every hand is raised. Every hand is raised. If you know this message ministered to you, that this message, hallelujah, had something to do with you, there is...